Welcome to This Week in Linux, episode 238. This episode is quite flavorful because we'll talk about what's new with all the various flavors of Ubuntu 2310. GNOME announced a new executive director for the GNOME Foundation. A vulnerability was found that might curl your toes a bit. All of this and more on this episode of This Week in Linux, your source for Linux. Good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Linbit. More on them later. Ubuntu 23.10 downloads are back online. We covered this last week with the latest release, but the translation issue that happened meant the downloads were taken down. With the new installer, you could use the legacy installer, but the new installer downloads were down. They are now back, so if you waited to try out the new installer, you can find links in the show notes for the downloads of that. Also, you'll find a link in the show notes for Destination Linux episode 344, where we talk about Ubuntu 23.10 and our opinion of it because we all reviewed it for that episode. So if you're curious about my take on the latest version of Ubuntu 23.10, you will find a link in the show notes for the next episode of Destination Linux 344, or you can bookmark destinationlinux.net slash 344. Up next in the show, we're going to talk about the latest release of Ubuntu 23.10, but the flavors this time, because there are a bunch of flavors. For those who are not aware, there are many of them, and we're going to cover the highlights of each one of them. But first, of course, they all have the latest Mesa drivers that Ubuntu 2310 has, as well as the latest Linux kernel with 6.5. Now, let's first start with Kubuntu. Kubuntu has updated their Plasma with 5.27. They've also updated KDE Gear to 23.08, And the Firefox Snap is now available as a default browser. And just real quick, the Snap is much faster. I tested it myself. It only took about three seconds to load, which is a huge improvement to previous versions of the Firefox Snap. Also, this has the latest Qt Toolkit of 5.15.10. And also, there is a really nice handy guide for enabling flat packs in KDE Discover in the release notes for Kubuntu 23.10. Also, just this is really cool news. The Kubuntu 22.04 LTS users can now upgrade to KDE Plasma 5.27 thanks to the work they did in the backports-extra PPA. And there's a lot more. You can find more details on the Kubuntu release in the show notes. Up next is Lubuntu. Lubuntu has the latest version of LXQ with 1.3.0. It has Qt 5.15.10. Featherpad has been updated to 1.3.5 and also many more changes for this release. If you'd like to learn more about the latest release of of Lubuntu 23.10, you will find links in the show notes. Zubuntu 23.10 also has a lot of changes and some really cool changes related to Pipewire and Bluetooth headphone support. It also has the latest XFCE, which is 4.18, and it's the same version that Zubuntu 2304 had, but there are some stuff that they are backporting from newer versions of XFCE in the development stage. So that's really cool. So it technically is 4.18, but there's extra stuff. So that's always nice. Also, there's now color emojis supported in Zubuntu 23.10. That might not seem like a big deal, but I have noticed myself using emojis quite a bit lately uh, in messages and having a pop-up window that just gives you quick access to put it in there. Very nice. So I'm glad to see that is happening. Also, various GNOME apps, including GNOME software to install apps, are available in in Zubuntu 23.10. There's also lots of improvements to the Thunar file manager and much more. You can find more information about the latest release in the show notes links. Up next is Ubuntu Budgie. This release of Ubuntu Budgie 23.10 has a lot of changes as well, including update to the GNOME 45 stack with Budgie's new Magpie window manager we talked about in a previous episode. I'll have that link in the show notes if you would like to learn more about Magpie. Plus also they've updated the Budgie's extras package as well as the Budgie desktop installer, which is interesting because they decided to make their own installer, which I'm not sure if it's based on the new Flutter installer, but the way they worded it kind of suggested it is, but I'm not sure. So if you would like to learn more and check to see if it is or not, (laughs) you'll find links in the show notes. Ubuntu Mate has been released with 23.10, and it has an update to the Mate desktop with the 1.26.2 version. Now, the majority of Ubuntu Mate is no longer going to be like big changes, it seems. There's seemingly just some minor changes here and there in the latest release. So, I mean, if you're using Ubuntu Mate, that's totally fine because 
Mate is a desktop that was a fork of a desktop from 20 years ago. So if you want something like that, it would make sense that you're not really interested in the latest and greatest and most polished and all that sort of stuff because, you know, stability is nice. Also, there's a really, really cool wallpaper in this release that was created with an AI thing and it's the Mantic Minotaur and it's probably my favorite wallpaper of all of the flavors, including Ubuntu proper itself. So if you would like to use that wallpaper, you'll find a link in the show notes. Now let's talk about Ubuntu Cinnamon 23.10. This is the latest update for the Cinnamon desktop with 5.8, and it also has 5.8.4 of the Nemo file manager. For those who are curious, I have tried to get them to call it Cinnabuntu, but unfortunately, they went with Ubuntu Cinnamon. Maybe we could have a code name someday that references that. One could hope. You'll find links in the show notes. Ubuntu Unity 23.10 saw a release as well, and it has the Unity 7.7 desktop, which is an updated version of the Unity desktop that was made by Canonical slash Ubuntu and is now maintained by the community and the Ubuntu Unity team. And also they announced that there's going to be a low Miri variant of Ubuntu Unity someday. They were planning to get it released this cycle, but they weren't able to get it done. So maybe the next release, maybe the one after that. I'm very much looking forward to that because Lumiri is the Unity 8 fork that the UbiPorts team made for Ubuntu Touch, and it looks really cool, and I would like to play with that. So Ubuntu Unity with Lumiri, I can't wait to try that. But Ubuntu Unity with Unity 7, or 7.7, is also fantastic, so check it out. You'll find links in the show notes. Ubuntu Studio 23.10, they switched back to the Ubiquity installer instead of the new Flutter installer, which I think is really only for the Ubuntu main proper version right now, but will probably be adopted at some point. And they were using the Calamari's installer, but there were some functionality issues, so they switched back this release. Also, there are some improvements for Pipewire, which is always great, and the KDE Plasma desktop backports that was in Kubuntu seems to be supported in Ubuntu Studio, for the 5.7 or 5.27 support of the Ubuntu Studio 22.04, which is really interesting because it's not the same distro, but they can use the same backports. And that's really nice to see a direct collaboration like that. So if you're interested in checking out Kubuntu or Ubuntu Studio, link in the show notes. And finally, Edge Ubuntu 23.10 is the first release after the initial launch of the return of this distribution. So this is really cool. They added a new whiteboard application, flashcard application, backup system. They also added an extension manager for GNOME extensions, as well as a new tool for learning basic called basic 256. And they mentioned how the technical lead started programming in basic. And that's cool. And it's also nice to have that there, but you should probably put stuff that's, you know, current, maybe rust or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but if you'd like to learn more about Edge Ubuntu 23.10, you'll find links in the show notes. And also, if you would like to learn more about any of the Ubuntu flavors for uh, the Ubuntu flavors of the 23.10 cycle, you'll find links to all of them in the show notes. The GNOME Foundation have announced that they have hired a new executive director for the GNOME Foundation, and that is Holly Million. I'm not sure if you say it as Million, but that's a cool name if it is. So on the announcement page, they say that Holly is a multi-talented individual with a diverse background in nonprofit leadership, filmmaking, teaching, public speaking, and writing. Her commitment to empowering individuals to make a positive impact aligns perfectly with the values and goals of the GNOME Foundation. They also go on to say that Holly brings three decades of invaluable experience in nonprofit management, having served as a consultant director of development, executive director, and board member for numerous organizations. Notably, she founded the nonprofit organization Artists United, dedicated to empowering individual artists and fostering collaboration across artistic disciplines for the collective good. Additionally, Holly served as the executive director of the BioBricks Foundation, an international open source biotechnology nonprofit. This is really cool. You can also check out the letter from the new executive director. I'll have that linked in the show notes as well as the announcement itself. There were some critiques of this person not being a developer, but the executive director of the GNOME Foundation is not the technical lead of GNOME. So they're more of the 
organizational benefit of like events and management of funds and stuff like that. So it's a different job than it might seem for the, you know, when you first look at it. So it does make sense that Hollywood have the criteria that she does in order to work with the thing that she is now being appointed to. So if you'd like to learn more about all of this, link in the show notes. This episode of Twill is brought to you by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010, and LinStore, industry-leading open source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open source community as well because they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features to their products. Limbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms without vendor lock-in, which is really cool because no matter what your OS is and no matter what kind of hardware you want to use, including off-the-shelf hardware, you're good to go with DRBD and LinStore. And also with DRBD and LinStore, you can have high-speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long-distance replication. Linbit provides really awesome services like DRBD, and DRBD is a really good way to make sure you have good data recovery and backups. And if you ever have like a cluster with multiple nodes and one of those nodes fails, you can have rest assurance that the backup nodes will have the data that you want. So if you're interested in checking out any of the software from Linbit, I highly recommend it. So go to linbit.com to check it out. That's L-I-N-B-I-T dot com. Curl 8.4 has been released. Curl is one of the most popular and fundamental data transfer tools available. So because of this, there was a release that was made earlier than expected due to a relatively severe security vulnerability that was found. Now, this vulnerability makes Curl overflow a heap-based buffer in the SOX 5 proxy handshake. For more details about what that means, you can find the link in the show notes to check that out. And I just wanted to cover it on the show because Curl is a fundamental project that is relied on by so many people. Yet it gets very little attention because it has become so ubiquitous that people just tend to expect it to always be there. And I know I'm giving it attention due to a vulnerability, which is not that great, but it deserves much more attention. And because it was on my mind, I wanted to give it some appreciation because it has played a critical role in the Linux ecosystem for 27 years now. I also appreciate how the developer of Curl is commenting on this issue because sure, it is important to get fixed and sure it is a vulnerability that needs addressing and all that, which they did do with the latest release. But also Daniel St Stenberg, I think as I said it right, said that in this announcement, in hindsight, shipping a heap overflow in code installed in over 20 billion instances is not an experience that he would recommend. And that makes sense. If you'd like to learn more about this new release of Curl or the vulnerability itself, you'll find links in the show notes. Up next in the show, we're going to talk about MX Linux 23.1. This is the first refresh release of MX 23. It contains bug fixes, kernel updates, application updates, and many more. Highlights of this release include updating to Debian 12.2 bookworm base, installer updates addressing swap file issues, hibernation and OEM install improvements. The AHS XFCE release features the 6.5 kernel, updated firmware, and Mesa libraries, and much more. This is really important because the AHS is for those who have newer hardware that are not necessarily going to be as well supported on the Debian base, because Debian is great in a lot of ways, but updating quickly is not one of them. So if you're going to make a Debian base, you do have to have a lot of updates on your side in order to support newer hardware. And that's what the AHS version is for. Now, let's talk about something I just think is kind of funny. If you go to the page hit ranking on DistroWatch, for those who have not heard of DistroWatch, it's a website that gives you news about new releases of distros and all sorts of details of what's based on what and uh, tons of cool information. It is one of the worst looking website designs ever, but it has a ton of great information. <laughs> But I think it's interesting because I was curious how long MX Linux has been number one on the page hit ranking list of DistroWatch. It's been a long time. They have been number one since 2019. I even checked the drop down and changed like different eras, different like six months from now or six months ago, 12 months ago. 
last year, the year before, and it kept going. And it was not until 2018 I found anything else on top. And that's pretty interesting. I'm not sure how they did that, but it is pretty interesting. And I just wanted to make it clear that being on the top of the page hit ranking on DistroWatch is not a ranking system of what is a good distro. It's how frequent someone goes to the page for that particular distro on DistroWatch. So it's not a rating system, although there are rating systems in that, that's not what is listed there. So I just wanted to clarify for those who are using DistroWatch as a reference point of what is the most popular. It's more of like, what's the most trending at the moment? Or in the case of MX Linux, always trending apparently. <laughs> If you'd like to learn more about the latest version of MX Linux 23.1, you'll find links in the show notes. The Fedora Project and the company Slimbook have announced a collaboration to deliver a new Fedora Slimbook Ultrabook. And this Fedora Slimbook is optimized for Fedora's specific hardware configurations, thereby providing users with a smoother out-of-the-box experience. And this hardware compatibility leads to an improved user experience overall. Now, this is not the first version of this collaboration, but it is the latest one and it is an Ultrabook, so that is pretty nice. I am very curious to see more, and maybe if someone does a review on it and that sort of thing, because it looks pretty interesting because it, it's a 16 inch, 16 by 10 uh, sRGB 99% display. It has a, it's also a 3K display with 90 Hertz. It has Intel Core i7-12700H with 20 threads. It has an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3050 Ti. It comes with up to 64 gigabytes of RAM and up to four terabytes of an NVMe SSD storage. Also, it has an 82 watt battery and it only comes in at 1.5 kilogram weight. And something that's pretty cool, it's kind of odd at the same time, but 3% of the revenue for each of these new Ultrabooks for the Fedora Slimbooks collaboration will be donated to the GNOME Foundation. And that's cool. And for those who are curious why the GNOME Foundation instead of Fedora, well, Fedora doesn't really accept donations, so they can't really participate in that way. And it makes sense that GNOME Foundation would be part of it because the default DE for Fedora Workstation is GNOME and will likely come on this laptop. So it kind of makes sense. But I would like to see a collaboration like this go to more than just one DE, maybe something that is a collective um, organization, nonprofit that spreads out more to a variety of different projects. That would be cooler if you can't do a direct donation to the thing you're collaborating with. That's just my opinion. Let me know in the comments what you think. And if you'd like to learn more about this latest laptop, you'll find links in the show notes. A new version of OnlyOffice has been released. OnlyOffice is an open source productivity suite for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and it's available for download right now for this latest version. There are various improvements to the core components of the OnlyOffice suite for the document editor, spreadsheet app, presentation maker, and also the form creator. And they've also added a new tool, which is a brand new PDF editor, which supports annotations, form filling, text comments, and drawing. Uh, PDF page thumbnails are also available, so you can pull you can, and all, you can also easily pull out headings of the PDF, and you can make it easy to find the text within the PDF with just a quick search. Also, other improvements include interface scaling options over 200%, warning if closing the app with multiple files open, an SVG image support, which is really cool to support vectors in a documentation because vectors are kind of perfect for print, so it's really nice to see that. Also, access popular symbols from insert symbol menu, also, you can use password protected files inside of OnlyOffice with this release. And it also has added support for screen readers, although the screen reader support is currently in beta. If you'd like to learn more about the latest release of OnlyOffice, you'll find links in the show notes. Sparky Linux 2023.10 rolling version has been released this week with updates to all of their various editions. Side note, I would like to request any distro or application or whatever project that has a version system that is based on the four four character year of 2023.10 for example to just drop the first part of the 20 because 23.10 is enough and we won't have to worry about that for 870 years so <laughs> anyway <laughs> 
So this latest version has updates to the various editions, which can include spins like the KDE Plasma version, the XFCE, LXQ, and Mate desktop environment versions. Also, this is based on Debian testing repositories, so it is a rolling release. It is not the fastest because Debian unstable slash Debian SID is technically faster, but it's called unstable for a reason, so it makes sense that they would be doing it through Debian testing. I like that. Also, it has the latest version of the Linux kernel with Linux 6.5 series. They also have LTS kernels available for those who would like it. Also, this latest release of Sparky Linux 2023.10 has added the Raspberry Pi imager to make it easier to install Sparky Linux or really anything if you want to on a Raspberry Pi, which is very cool. Also, Firefox 115.3.0 ESR is available by default. However, for those who want a new up-to-date version, Firefox dash Sparky does seem to be a deb maintained by the Sparky team. So you will get one, one, eight, you get 118.0.2 for that version. So if you want a newer version rather than the one that comes with Debian, you can check that out. And also there's a lot more for this release. You can find more information in the links on the show notes. Speaking of Firefox ESR, Tor Browser 13.0 has been released this week, and this version is built on top of the latest ESR with Firefox 115. As part of this process, they've also completed an annual ESR transition audit where they review Firefox's changelog for issues that may negatively affect the privacy and security of the Tor Browser users and disable any problematic patches where necessary, which is pretty cool. You can check out the full audit that is linked in the show notes. Also, the Tor Browser 13.0 is the first release to inherit the redesign accessibility engine introduced by Mozilla and Firefox 113. This change promises to improve performance significantly for people who use screen readers and other assistive technology. They've also redesigned the, uh, the homepage or the about colon Tor page, which looks much, much better. And they've also, due to it, this new redesign, they've also fixed the red screen of death bug that was kind of notorious in the Tor browser because it was a bug that happened and it kind of warned in you and scared you a little bit, but it wasn't really doing anything and it wasn't actually finding anything. So they fixed that, which is nice. If you'd like to learn more about the latest release of the Tor browser with Tor browser 13.0, you'll find links in the show notes. This week, we got some awesome news from the company Focusrite. Focusrite has offered some assistance for developers to help get better support on Linux for their products, which is really cool. Jeffrey Bennett is a user on the Linux Musicians Forum and is known for the work he does to bring Linux support to these popular Focusrite audio interfaces like the Scarlet Second and Third Generation. And he wanted to create the support for the Scarlet Gen 4 as well. So he created a GoFundMe for the Linux driver for Focusrite Scarlet Gen 4 and that fundraiser was a success. Now, the way it was a success is pretty cool. There's a lot of people who donated to the GoFundMe in general, but also the final pledge to make it get the goal was made by Focusrite themselves. Also, to quote Jeffrey from the forum and also the GoFundMe, he says, While I have previously struggled to connect with the engineers or management at Focusrite, news of the overwhelming response to this fundraiser reached the top tiers of Focusrite. Given the niche nature of Linux audio, I had kept my expectations in check, but this was beyond what I imagined. He also goes on to say, I just got off a call with them where beyond providing the hardware, they were inquiring about other ways they could support the development. For example, he goes on to say that Focusrite not only offered to send him devices, he also said that they were offering to send him devices for anything of their products that are not already in his collection. And they also propose that for any future product releases, they would do the same. And they will do as much as they can to send him devices in advance. So it's possible that we would have Linux support on the product launch day one, which is really awesome. Also, he goes on to say that they are discussing how their engineering team could better help to streamline the development process and eliminate much of the guesswork to directly help the support for Linux and the Scarlet, these, you know, these Scarlet Focusrite products, which is really, really cool. Now, I would say that it's kind of weird that the GoFundMe collected the money when Focusrite could just say, hey, refund all the money and here's the product rather than taking the money in addition. But I hopefully they'd use that money for more than just purchasing this product. I would hope that they would 
give them the product and use that for development purposes and stuff like that. Because I think that would be a more ideal situation. But overall, this is fantastic news and well done to Focusrite. If you'd like to learn more about this, you'll find links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux world and the open source world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership, where you can get a bunch of cool perks like access to the patron-only sections of our Discord server and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt that I'm wearing right now at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, check out all the other cool stuff we have like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and more at tuxdigital.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of your source for Linux news. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell, and I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring the notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell. <laughs>